Hello, everybody, and you're very welcome. This is Brian Motherway here in Paris at the International Energy Agency. We're delighted to be convening the first ever meeting of the IEA's Clean Energy Labour Council. We're delighted you're all joining us as members and, of course, on the live stream audience around the world. Let me uh, hand straight away to our co-chair, Mr. Becky and Charlie and Charlie. Becky, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm proud that you pronounce my difficult surname so uh, eloquently, but thank you very much, Brian. Let me just say as an introduction that uh, clean energy transition should be people-centered and inclusive. And that is essential to the success of energy system transformation at the pace and scale required to deliver global ambition for climate change mitigation. Substantive uh, trade union and community organization participation in the decarbonization processes has been identified as a key component in reducing the adverse socioeconomic impact of decarbonization. And clean energy transmission will create jobs, enhance our quality of life, and ensure a clean and healthy environment. The issues union have been fighting for in building a full employment, decent jobs, livelihood, gender equality, clean water for all, food security, affordable access to healthcare, better education, decent housing in the well-planned settlement with good affordable transport, people uniting to help each other, environmental sustainability and economy, which, people, which put people before the profit, are all the same issues that will strengthen us to deal with climate change and usher in new trust transition. The just transmission as a concept emerged from the international labor movement, which was led by the ITUC and the International Labor Organization involving a very, very long struggle. But at the 2010 United Nations Framework Commission on Climate Change Conference, which was held in Cancun, Mexico, organized labor successfully lobbied for the inclusion of the concept of a just transition in the UNFCCC negotiations. The Paris Agreement of 2015 accepted the yellow guidelines for just transition, stating that, and I quote, policies guiding the transition from fossil fuel to renewable energy to renewable must promote the creation of more decent jobs anticipate the impact on employment and social protection for job losses and displacement, skills development and social dialogue, including the effective exercise of the right to organize and bargaining collectively. Colleagues and comrades with those words, I'd like to welcome the members to this Labor Council meeting and look forward to a successful collaboration between Labor and the IEA. The Labor Council will provide input and advice from the Labor on the IF work, building a collaboration with and work with the ILO, facilitate collaboration and analysis to support the trade union and energy minister in delivering the just transition tailored to their own circumstances. Let me take maybe this opportunity to invite Fred Perron to make his opening remarks. Perron. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Vice Chair. Thank you very much, Becky. Uh, and thank you very much for joining uh, uh, us for this uh, first ever meeting of the IEA Clean Energy Labor Council. I am delighted that this initiative uh, has been with so much interest and enthusiasm from uh, all of you and uh, across the world. This meeting, uh, dear colleagues, uh, comes at a crucial time in the global history. There is a humanitarian crisis uh, taking place uh, in uh, Ukraine, and this crisis has huge implications for the global energy markets as uh, Russia is today uh, the, the top number one oil exporter of the world and number one natural gas exporter of the world. 
So at the IEA, we are trying to uh, provide response to this crisis so that the high energy prices do not harm the economies and the, uh, the uh, peoples uh, of this world. We have uh, recently published a, a plan, 10 point action plan uh, for the European Union, how we can reduce the reliance on uh, the Russian uh, gas imports, including a lot of uh, accelerated action on energy efficiency, renewable energies, uh, so that those actions we take not only reduce the imports, improve the energy security, but also helps us to accelerate our clean energy transitions. We also see uh, oil prices being uh, very high, and this uh, has an impact on many things, including the LPG in uh, developing countries to diesel, to uh, gas oil, which affects the entire economy. And in that respect, uh, what we have done is uh, uh, our member countries uh, release 60 million barrels of oil to the market, to comfort the market. And next week, we are coming up with another 10 action plan, how we can reduce oil use with the action coming from governments and the citizens between now and this summer, the driving season when the oil demand is uh, very high. But one thing is very important, uh, we believe at the IEA, the actions we are taking uh, to improve the energy security should go hand in hand with our other crisis, which is to address climate change. Many of you know the clean energy transitions is at the heart of the IES work. We work with many governments, institutions, the energy industry, and the citizens uh, around the world to make sure that the clean energy transition is a just one and the pace is strong as it uh, needs to be. And in that respect, uh, last year, I convened a, another commission, which we call Global Commission on People-Centered Clean Energy uh, Transitions. And it brought together 30 energy and climate ministers, thought leaders, and civil society representatives to consider how to ensure all clean energy transitions are truly people-centered and inclusive. It was chaired by the prime minister of uh, uh, Denmark, and the co-chaired by the energy minister of Senegal. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, General Secretary Sharon uh, Barrow. Many thanks, uh, Sharon, for all your leadership and the discussions we had in this commission, as well as Ambassador Muriel Penico. Uh, Muriel is also here. Many thanks, uh, Muriel, for your uh, guidance. Uh, and I benefited a lot. Uh, to address these issues in uh, Europe, in Africa, Latin America, and elsewhere. Our global commission has made uh, 12 key recommendations just before the Glasgow meeting. And I was very happy to see that the recommendations this commission made uh, had a, a significant echo and impact on government's uh, decision and they are still making. Throughout the process of the global commission on people-centered clean energy transition, I was struck by the importance of the voice of labor and the growing importance of ties between labor and climate uh, action. It is why I decided to convene this new Clean Energy Labor Council to provide the forum to foster dialogue between the IEA, our stakeholders and the labor sector, a key and central voice in just transitions. IEA has a strong convening power around the energy world, and we would like to make sure that the Clean Energy Labor Council strengthen our uh, voice in that effect. This new op uh, initiative will operate in parallel to the IES Energy Business Council. I convened the Energy Business Council some 13 years ago when I was a chief economist, bringing major 
energy companies, 50 energy companies around the world who make the investments, who produce uh, renewables, oil, efficiency, and others. And uh, I think uh, to have this uh, new uh, commission that we are uh, uh, integrating today will be uh, mirroring that uh, uh, our efforts in that uh, respect. Uh, I uh, would like to also thank uh, the many of the uh, colleagues who are joining us uh, around the world uh, today. And this council brings together labor representatives and civil society voices from all over the world, representing a wide range of perspectives and circumstances. I am delighted that the uh, General Secretary, uh, Sharon Barrow, many thanks once again, Sharon, from the International Trade Union Confederation and uh, General Secretary Becky, thank you very much, Becky, from the Congress of South African Trade Unions have agreed to co-chair this new initiative. My thanks also goes to uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Brian Motherway, who has been instrumental to facilitate this initiative. Thank you very much to all of you, but especially to Sharon and Becky for your leadership on this very important issue. And uh, I would like to finish by saying that I have, as head of the IEA, great uh, expectations uh, from the deliberations and working of this uh, council. You can rest assured that the discussions here we are going to have, what we are going to learn as International Energy Agency uh, from yourself will be an inspiration for our work. And we will be very happy to convey your messages, your preoccupations with the governments, with the energy industry and all other uh, stakeholders. So once again, uh, many thanks to all of you from us in Paris IE headquarters. With this, I am turning back uh, to uh, Becky uh, to continue with the discussions. Thank you very much for your encouraging words. Uh, indeed, we, uh, you give us confidence and hope that uh, choosing this platform is the right decision and we thank for the leadership of Sharon for doing that. Uh, indeed, uh, it's a recognition that uh, labor has a role to play in dealing with the challenges that we, we are facing and we hope uh, moving forward we'll be able to share our experiences, learn from each other because it needs all of us to be able to address the issues of climate change. This being our first engagement and first meeting, and considering that we don't have much time, may I request people who are participating here to briefly do the introduction, if that is, is okay with everyone, and say it's, uh, who you are uh, and all those things. Uh, Sharon, will you lead on that? Certainly, Becky, I'd be delighted to. And uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Birrell, we are absolutely delighted, Fatty, to be with you. I thank you for your leadership, in fact, not just of the IEA, but your consideration for, indeed, um, the inclusion of people and, in our case, of workers for, you know, just and sustainable economies in a future which has to be, of course, uh, aligned with the Paris Agreement. So, we know your job is difficult, even more difficult at the moment, and I'll come back to some of that. But in the meantime, let me absolutely ask, uh, first on my screen, Plumman, would you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sharon, and uh, good afternoon, every, everyone. Um, my name is Plumman Dimitrov. I am uh, president of the, largest, of the largest trade union confederation in Bulgaria. And uh, I'm also a member of uh, uh, Workers Group uh, a Governing Body of the ILO in, uh, in my country, but also in a both international and uh, European trade union configuration, very much involved in a, uh, uh, just transition issues. Uh, you know that Bulgaria is a co-dependent uh, country heavily at this, at this moment. So we are in a transition uh, and uh, with the support of uh, both RLF and JTF, uh, uh, recovery and resilient facility and uh, uh, John, uh, just transition facility of the next generation EU uh, plan of European uh, Union. Uh, we are trying to uh, develop here uh, together with the businesses, but also with the government, 
uh, strategy and concrete plans for uh, transitioning to green and digital uh, economy. And um, meanwhile, uh, this is very intensive uh, debates in my country now. Uh, in in five, 5 30, I have a meeting with the Minister of Energy exactly on this issue. 5 30 Bulgarian time, I mean, so 4 30 um, Paris time. And this is ongoing dialogue, uh, which is very intensive in my country. It's pity that we are not part uh, yet from OECD, but it's going to come, uh, I hope, in a, in a few months, uh, hopefully, since we applied uh, for, for a full membership uh, as a country. Thank you very much. Thanks, Plumman. Ellie? Eli, our sister Eli is from Indonesia. Please introduce yourself. Thank you, Sister Saran. Thank you, uh, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Eli Rosita. I'm president of uh, Confederation, the biggest one uh, confederation in Indonesia. I'm very happy to be here because I really appreciate to discuss about, about this. But uh, I think I uh, have to share a little bit about uh, to you uh, Indonesian international commitment to the issue of global warming. Climate change is increasingly threatening to survival of the earth. You know, Indonesia already said uh, a threshold of 1.5 until 2030 have not found significant progress. Indonesia, which is in the order of the world for largest emitter carbon brief, 2015 is considered not to have optimally implemented its policies and is considered to be in highly insufficient category. And uh, because I am here uh, speaking on behalf of workers, most of the global workforce work directly or indirectly for the uh, fossil fuel economy and many other industries that depend on other sources that depend on unsustainable energy sources. And then, I found of also in Indonesia, lack of knowledge behind its impact. The transition can impact many aspects of life, including the environment, society, but I, we didn't see the, the, uh, the concentration or the action concrete do by the government uh, right now. Uh, of course, uh, on behalf of uh, trade union or working organization, we fully support if we can do something uh, to make the world better uh, from now on. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. And indeed, uh, Rhoda, you are, of course, uh, our secret weapon in Africa, coordinating uh, all of our country uh, folk around climate and just transition. So, Rhoda, introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Sharon. And it's a delight to be here and to connect with all of you and with our friends from the IEA. I must convey a sincere appreciation for this um, convening, but then specifically for the initiative, which we think is very timely. Um, my name is Rhoda Boatin. I'm working as program coordinator of climate and environment issues within ITUC Africa, which is a regional office of the ITUC Africa. And so this means um, working with our affiliates across the region, specifically about 100 affiliates um, from across 52 African countries. So that's a lot of work, um, representing over 17 million and counting workers across the, across the continent. And so with our work, we're really trying at the moment, what's most important for us is really focusing on how to ensure that NDCs um, incorporate just transition elements. And we all know that um, um, the current states of NDCs that have been submitted do not really meet the necessary targets that we, we seek to achieve um, or we seek to, to achieve um, the Paris Agreement. And so this is a, a lot of um, work that's ongoing and it's very crucial, specifically as we work on trying to raise ambitions, but then specifically also seeing how countries would really ensure that the just transition elements and the questions around social and ecological crisis are actually um, implemented or taken on board in the implementation of just transition um, of NDCs within their countries. And so we are looking forward to how um, this council would also interface with um, the business council to really see how we can draw synergies and complement each other in our work um, at various levels to really reach the desired goals of um, cutting down emissions within the time that we need to looking at the new IPCC report that has come forward and stressing on the urgency for us to do this um, very quickly. So yes, excited to be here. Thanks. 
Thank you, Rhoda. B, I can see you in the, the window. Um, B is indeed uh, the president of the CLC, as she'll tell you, the Canadian Labor Con Congress, but she's actually um, the, the country that represents our very first Just Transition Commission, which of course was about exiting from coal. Very brave, very courageous uh, trade union movement, B. Thank you for that, Sharon. And yes, I'm B. Brask. I'm the president of the Canadian Labour Congress, and we represent 54 different affiliates right across Canada, just over 3 million workers. Um, you know, and as Sharon said, in Canada, we do have a very large oil and gas sector. It's very regionally concentrated, primarily in our western provinces, and employment is, is very concentrated in just a few provinces. And so that, of course, is responsible for over 150,000 jobs, direct jobs, and many more spin-off jobs. Canada absolutely has committed to um, a deadline of 2030 for phasing out coal-fired electricity. And in some provinces here, it's moving much more quickly. We did have the Just Transition Task Force for coal power workers and communities, and it was led by labor. And it did produce a very good series of pragmatic um, recommendations for supporting those affected workers through Just Transition. Um, Canada has committed to introducing Just Transition legislation, and we're in consultations on that right now. Workers in Canada understand that climate change uh, is real and that we have to urgently act to limit warming in order to prevent uh, even more impacts of climate change that we've seen in our country over the last year specifically. Um, we want to make sure that uh, workers have a seat at that table and that legislation is providing for that both at the national level but also sector by sector. And we know that there's unique challenges in various different sectors that we need to be creative with. We want to make sure that we have uh, a path towards high quality union jobs in a net zero economy. It's absolutely critical. And it means we have to engage with workers in those particular areas. So we're looking forward to participating um, in this way and to um, learning and uh, giving back. Thanks, B. And I will say that Canada is one of the countries where we are engaging in dialogue with Indigenous people as well because as stewards of the land and the forest, as we look to our global commons, then this, is, uh, this remains unfinished business in both a justice and a climate sense. So thank you. I, uh, I see Frederick here. Frederick, of course, is from Germany and uh, one of the most active uh, labor unions in not just energy transition, although that's true, but also an industrial transition. So. Perhaps, Frederick, you could introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, Sharon, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for the organization of this Energy uh, uh, Labor Council, and um, um, thank you for inviting me. My name is Frederick Moch. Um, I'm the head of um, um, Department for Structural Policy, Industry and Services at the German uh, Confederation of Trade Unions. Um, we and our affiliates are working very intensively on all these aspects of the transition into a carbon neutral economy and especially um, yeah we work very intensively on uh, the issue of energy transition the coal uh, phase out in germany you all might know um, the dgb was uh, involved uh, very deeply and um, yeah i am looking very forward um, to our debates here. And um, I hope that we will have um, some good and joint proposals um, on a rapid energy transition. I think this is necessary in our days and also on a just transition, which is necessary to organize it in a fair way and uh, in a socially just way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Frederick. And I, I know we'll hear a presentation from Germany later on to give everybody a sense. We would like to do this at each meeting of the practical, uh, you know, structural and investment transitions that unions are working on. Um, Shoya, Shoya also, uh, Brother Shoya represents the Asia Pacific region. And of course, with all of its uh, attendant difficulties. So Shoya, introduce yourself. Okay, thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, I am Shoya Yoshida, General Secretary of the ITUC Asia Pacific. 
Our region is not so well advanced in the area of just transition, uh, particularly due to the lack of finances, investment, technology, and the strong commitment of the government. So throughout our discussion in the council, I'd like to ensure stronger commitment to the just transition, not only of, of government, but also businesses, as well as the trade unions as a responsible uh, social partners. Thank you very much, Shara. Over to you. Thank you, Shoya. And Peggy, I can see you in my screen. And indeed, Norway, of course, is not just an amazing international partner for many countries working on re emissions reductions and just transition, but Peggy heads up the LO, which is absolutely taken on transition in a very ambitious way. So Peggy. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you for inviting me. I am the president of uh, uh, the Norwegian uh, Confederation of Labour Unions, which is the largest confederation in uh, Norway. Uh, and we also uh, do organize uh, uh, work it both in the uh, oil and gas industry, uh, but also across sectoral, both private sector and, and public sector workers. So, so we have a broad uh, um, uh, perspective when it comes to uh, uh, energy policies and also, of course, into just uh, transition. As some of you might know, Norway has uh, for a very long time been a supplier of energy. We built all our industries and our fortunes first on hydropower energy. We never went through the coal uh, uh, age as uh, the rest of you. We built our uh, strength on hydropower, which is still very, very important to us in Norway. And then along came the oil and gas industry in the 60s and, and 70s. So our transition is now going from hydropower and into new green energy sources uh, to uh, make sure that our uh, oil and uh, uh, gas industry workers uh, of today uh, can also uh, um, can also uh, um, be um, be able to to uh, maintain their uh, good incomes and their uh, uh, expertise into the new green energy uh, uh, producing uh, um, uh, industries that we need to come up with. And we are also, as the rest of the Europeans are, are telling, uh, very affected now by the situation in uh, Ukraine. Our uh, energy prices are extremely high at the moment. Uh, Norway, part of Norway, a big part of Norway is uh, within uh, the Arctic uh, um, part of the world. So you can imagine we need a lot of energy, both for heating our houses, for, for light. We, we are uh, consumers of, uh, uh, of energy. So this is, leads just now to, to very strong discussions in Norway in how to form our future when it comes to energy. So it's a very, uh, it's a very important, uh, it's very important questions uh, these days, and it's top of the mind of uh, our government, uh, and also when it comes to to the situation in in Europe itself. So uh, we are very much looking forward to these important uh, uh, discussions. We are also uh, uh, building on the Norwegian, the Nordic model when it comes to dialogue with uh, both the government, but also with the, uh, with the uh, energy companies. Uh, we are in close uh, dialogue with them uh, at all times. So, uh, so um, I, I'll be more than happy to, to contribute also on that, uh, uh, in that way. And I do look forward to, uh, to our uh, discussions. And we're also housing the, the Just Transi Transition Center, uh, uh, Sharon. And, uh, and so we are in close contact with uh, Samantha and uh, her crew here in Oslo. So, uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'll be happy to join. Indeed, uh, Peggy, and we're very grateful to you for that because our Just Transition Centre, we built after the Paris Agreement. It's led indeed by Sam Smith and uh, 
Sam is uh, my Sherpa for this uh, venture because somebody has to do all the work. And, uh, and indeed, Lebo is her co-worker who is supporting Becky. And I'm very grateful to both of them. So perhaps quickly, Sam and, Le and Lebo, seeing I've uh, noted you, you could introduce yourselves. Thank you so much, Erin, and uh, thanks for the, uh, for the opportunity to participate and, and also to do some of the work. Um, not much to say. We're very excited about this opportunity to um, make sure that uh, the work of the IEA continues to build on what the labor movement is doing on, on just transition and the clean energy transition. But also, um, as you mentioned, Mr. Burrell, the opportunity to interact with the CEO's group and with some of the other institutions. So thanks a lot. Looking forward to working with you all. Thanks, Sam. Lebo? Thanks, Sharon. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lebo Hangulaisi. I'm the Labor Market Policy Coordinator for COSADU. I am acting as the Sherpa for the General Secretary of COSADU. Uh, the work that I do is around making sure that, you know, workers' voices are heard on the Just Transition agenda here in South Africa, and we're in a very exciting time, um, especially when it comes to, you know, transition planning, pathway planning, and ensuring that the language of a just transition, but what labor meant in its initial conceptualization of a just transition is embedded in all of our policy um, negotiations here in South Africa. It's actually quite exciting work, and it links up very nicely with the work um, of the Labour Council. So we're very excited um, to participate. I think it gives our work a lot of meaning because not only do we see it playing out in, you know, some of the regional um, political, geopolitical issues, but now seeing it in the political economy of the rest of the world, it's starting to really bear a lot of fruit um, from the inputs that I've just been listening to. You know, people say that trade unionists only think about wages and working conditions. And I think this meeting proves them all wrong. <laughs> trade unionists are thinking about the future and the future of work and how we make sure that workers continue to be protected and factored into those futures. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Lebo. We do like wages and working conditions, though. <laughs> but, uh, but Lebo's right. We do see our role as being industry partners for with uh, like-minded employers and, and governments to actually uh, build our societies and jobs. So um, I have Brad, you on my screen here. Brad, would you introduce yourself? Brad's carried the very difficult job in the previous iteration of the administration in the US to try and advance this issue, these issues. So Brad. Well, thank, thank you, Sharon, and thanks to the IEA for forming this council. Uh, and Sharon's right, uh, it's uh, sort of a tale of two cities, and the previous administration had us going backwards on climate and backwards on, on uh, everything we value. And now the Biden administration has uh, given us a chance. Uh, you know, the, the U.S., I think, is in a similar situation to Norway and Canada. Fossil fuel production is, is uh, very important to our economy. Uh, and, but we're starting to see technologies come into the marketplace that are reducing the demand for fossil fuels. And, and in, the, in a paradox, for example, you see some of the, the big crazy pickup trucks that uh, Americans like to drive are becoming the first electric vehicles in the market. Uh, the transition that we need to undergo is going to take billions and billions of dollars of investment and uh, the technical work of the IEA and our Department of Energy and the interaction between IEA and, and, and DOE is really important in helping us shape that transition and shape that spending. We've got over $60 billion US dollars in uh, demonstration projects that are funded here in the US. And we're really hoping that we're gonna be able to figure out how these technologies are gonna play in the marketplace. And as Sharon said, to be able to form partnerships with the companies that are investing in these technologies. But we have to push hard. In the United States, there is a, a uh, in some quarters of the business community, a deeply anti-worker, anti-union culture. And I think that, you know, with bodies like this, we're able to communicate about our values, about our desire to uh, partner for an energy transition. Because if we don't work together and if we're not 
shaping those investments. We're not going to transition as, as quickly as we need to. And this is an all hands on deck situation. So, so thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for pulling this council together. And thank you, Brad. Uh, indeed, uh, difficult work across such a big country, but uh, we appreciate it. I've got a very special sister here, Carmen, who, to be honest, I've walked uh, the streets in several cities with Carmen, with the peasants movement, with uh, Indigenous people, and of course, with the unions. And I haven't seen Carmen since before COVID uh, um, attacked us. And of course, she has a difficult government to deal with too, although we're optimistic this year, Carmen. So welcome, and it's fantastic to see you. You're on mute, Carmen. You have to unmute yourself. É preciso. Ok. Obrigada, Sharon. Obrigada. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, everyone, for participating uh, in this meeting that is so important. We need to have this discussion about the future of the planet, the future uh, for people. I'm coming for I'm the Secretary General of Cuti, Brazil. I live in the Brazilian Amazon. And we understand that fighting for a fairer society with more rights should be based on a sustainable development model. So this discussion is extremely important. We need it in order to face the climate crisis, which is part of a capitalistic vision of how to exploit natural resources. You know that we have clean energy in Brazil. And so I'm extremely happy to be part of this discussion because we want to talk about clean energy because it has an impact on the lives of workers. I come from a region in the state of Pará in Brazil, where we have one of the biggest hydroelectric plants. We didn't have access to electricity for many years, and we still face the consequences of the production of clean energy because these hydroelectric plants have an impact on the lives of people. So it is extremely important for us to take part in this discussion. I'm extremely grateful, Sharon. For us, it's fundamental to take part in this debate on climate change and the question of energy production in our country. We need to continue this discussion. And that will be done with our participation in different uh, areas of discussion. Thank you so much, Sharon and everyone. Thank you, Carmen. And uh, indeed, thank you for your work. Now, I think that's all of the Labour representatives here, but we have some guests. If I've missed someone, please, you're not shy. Just yell out and tell me. But we have some guests. And uh, let's start with two women I know very well and deeply respect. One is L Laurence Tubiana. She is, of course, the, uh, um, she runs the European Climate Foundation, and I'm pleased to support her work. Laurence. You're on mute, Laurence. Thank you, Sharon, and, and thank you, Fatih, for organizing this uh, exceptional panel. I'm, I'm very honored to be part of it. Um, and uh, and again, thanking you as many has done on your leadership uh, before that crisis and in that crisis in particular. Um, I am ha very happy and honored to listen to your discussion and contribute if I may at one point in time, because I do think that now the climate community uh, has understood that just transition is has to be at the center of uh, the energy transition. And we have to start by that and not to land by that as an afterthought. And that's what I am intending to listen and from all of you to, in a way, make 
the best of the connection with the, all the movements that are trying to put climate very high on the political agenda, which is the job of the European Climate Foundation. Thank you, Farhan. Thank you, Laurence. And uh, for those of you who know Laurence, you know her reach and her network and her courageous advocacy is extraordinary. So we're very lucky to be associated with you. Muriel Penico is indeed a woman who I've got to know very well and call a friend because often when we ask governments for help, Labor ministers particularly, but in other roles as well, you know, then it's usually about rights and social justice or transition uh, and just transition measures. And Muriel is one of those uh, people who have been there in the fight for both social justice and social protection through workplaces at every turn. And I really value that. Muriel. Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, I would like first to thank uh, Fatih Birol for his uh, renewed leadership on this topic. And uh, it's very innovative and very new that uh, IEA uh, launched this Clean Energy Labour Council. And I think we all agree um, that it's extremely important. Uh, energy transition cannot succeed if there is a, uh, see, it's not people-centered and inclusive. And as a former Minister of Labour, of an ambassador to the OECD, uh, today for France and uh, as a candidate for the LO, you know, all that. I think it's something we have to put at the heart of all our actions. And um, we were very happy with Fatih and uh, with Sharon also to contribute uh, for the COP26 uh, on the commission on that. But I think now we need to uh, push this initiative further. And uh, again, congratulations for the launch of this council because there are so many things that are even amplified by the crisis, by the, by the war in Ukraine. Um, gas and oil becomes a strategic resources and use, used by like weapons uh, uh, also by Russia. And it will change the game also of the just transition. So it makes it even more important. Uh, you mentioned several of you, the, the, the cost uh, of access to energy that is going to be a very, very, big problem for the most vulnerable countries and for the most vulnerable people. At the same time, we know there will be a huge shift in jobs and uh, it can be a lot of opportunity to create new decent jobs in green economy, but uh, how to make sure that we don't leave no, uh, no one behind uh, with all the workers we, which are uh, working in the fossil um, industries. And so th this question are huge and I think we, it's a very good example today of how we can uh, ally different kind of people and uh, the unions uh, with IAA and uh, some other person will will we would like to help. Uh, it's very important. I will have proposal uh, later in the discussion uh, if you want. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed, Muriel. And I have another guest here, Mr. Chandra Buskin, who. I haven't met, so I'm looking forward to your introduction. Thank you, Sharon. And uh, let me first uh, compliment IEA for bringing labor and some of us together uh, who, who have started working on the issue of just transition from political economy perspective. So I'm Chandabhushan and I'm from India. I work uh, at an organization called as International Forum for Environment, Sustainability and Technology, in short, iForest. And we have set up a center called India Just Transition Center uh, to work on various aspects of just transition in Global South. Uh, we are doing some uh, grassroots research, uh, ground level research to understand what just transition will mean and entail for us because the knowledge that has come on just transition is largely from the global north. And we need to tailor that knowledge uh, for global south. And over the last uh, few years, two years actually, when we have started doing deep research in this, uh, we, can, we can clearly see the difference uh, in approach uh, that would be required for just transition uh, in the global south. Uh, for example, the issue of informal labor. Uh, unorganized labor, the issue of informal economy, the issue of livelihood, 
and as I said, the, the whole issue of political economy. So I'm very happy to be part of this panel. I think uh, um, we will be able to provide inputs and I look forward to engaging with all of you. Very excited to see all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure that uh, Sam and our Just Transition staff look forward to sharing ideas and views and research with you indeed. And I, I'd like to make sure that your work is intersecting with our union's work in India, because indeed uh, building energy collectives, uh, cooperatives, training women to substitute solar panels for diesel pumps in industries like the salt mines, setting up clean energy hubs, this is the work of uh, Siwa and indeed many of our uh, friends in India. So that I look forward to that cooperation. In, I wonder, Matt and Brian, do you want to introduce yourselves perhaps so we know the players that are backing up Fatty? Thank you, Sharon. And um, thank you, everybody. It's a great pleasure to meet all of you that we haven't met before. And we're really delighted so many of you have agreed to, to join this, this process. In particular, thanks, of course, to Sharon and Becky and, of course, to Sam and, and Lebo. So I am Brian. I work here at the IEA with Dr. Baral, and, and I lead the team that works in this area, People Centered Clean Energy Transitions and Just Transitions. So it's a great privilege to be able to work on these really important topics. I'm joined by my colleagues, Celine, Matt, and Ghislaine, who are not on camera, but they all say hello. Uh, they're all listening intently, and we look forward to the rest of these discussions. Thank you, Sharon. And I thank them for the, both the support on detail and, of course, technical backup. So, look, I'm going to just say a very, a very briefly a few things about the framework and the background and our partnership with the IEA. And then I'm going to actually hand it back to Sam to introduce our two presentations, because I think the meat is to get into some practical work that this, uh, this group is doing on the ground. We very much see the work that Sam leads for us, the just transition work as bringing unions to the table. We also have a broader team in here that look to the policy settings and the interaction with the uh, industry leaders and the COP and so on. But Sam does our most valuable work with her team. And that is where it counts, trying to drive the support for unions engaged in just transition and actually uh, it, it, across all industries, and of course with our global union federations and partnerships beyond uh, the union movement. The, uh, the IEA though took a very bold and courageous step when it uh, pulled together a commission on people-centered uh, clean energy transitions and invited people like me to the table who could uh, indeed put the perspectives and the expectations of labor on the agenda. As Muriel said, it was indeed a, a fabulous experience because the overlap in the concerns from industry, from trade unions, and indeed from communities, and the role that we saw for the IEA to play in being a lead advocate and I commend Fatty on his courage in bringing those people together. I won't go through all the recommendations, but I urge you to read the report. That it covers decent jobs and worker protection, social and economic development, equity, social inclusion and fairness, and people as active participants. It goes to the heart of job creation, job defending jobs, transforming jobs and job creation through energy transitions. It also uh, looks towards uh, the development of support for communities and workers, and of course, brings into perspective the skills and the reskilling we need to deal with some of those transitions. But most important of all, it actually does talk about policies that will enhance social and economic development and improve the quality of life for everybody including for workers in, uh, in safe workplaces. And it has expectations of governments. And remember, the IEA has government members. It has a business council, but it also has government min ministers and, uh, and governments more broadly. And the government support for communities and workers, that's a really important part of this. So as 
trade unionists, social dialogue is in our DNA. We mightn't always agree with our dialogue partners, but we believe very much in negotiating areas of agreement and settlement that actually um, make sure that we can move forward in a transparent way. And when you when we went to the COP, and I credit the IEA and, and particularly with the backdrop of its commission and recommendations for its influence in the COP around these questions. We've seen declarations by governments before because we fought for them. We fought for just transition in the preamble of the, uh, of the Paris Climate Agreement. We fought for rules to cover those elements of justice in, in the uh, COP playbook, in government behaviour, as Rhoda said, in NDCs. But we also have seen um, declarations, even in Poland, the president of the Polish COP, when some of our government friends told us they couldn't really focus this time on just transition because there were so many other things. The president of the COP in Silesia actually um, changed those views by taking, working with us on a declaration. They had over 50 heads of government sign. And then we saw a bit of a lull. People were interested in just transition at the local level. Some governments we saw, we've seen a number of commissions or working groups or working parties, but it's not moving fast enough. And we know that indeed, if you don't have the trust of people, as Plumman said, if they don't know what the plan is, then you will not get the trust to scale up. You simply won't get the trust to meet the mammoth effort for cleaning our economies that we need to make by 2030. So when we arrived at the COP in Glasgow, we had worked, as Sam will tell you, on the, uh, on the, energy, the just transition declaration that the uh, UK government sponsored. But uh, Fatty, I compliment and credit you with a lot of drive around this because for the first time, when I was asked to co-launch the Energy Day and it was energy and just transition, it made a big impact. It made a big impact. But we are still having to push to see the commitments made there play out. And today you will hear two case studies, which Sam will introduce more fulsomely, but one of them was played out at the COP. At least the framework and the financing in part was played out at the COP. You know, I, I will never forget Becky, your Labor Minister, Barbara, when I was uh, proud to launch the investment into South Africa's transition of ESCOM, the energy company. Your minister laid it out clearly. She said, every, um, every, if you walk into a community around ESCOM facilities, every clothesline will have an ESCOM uniform on it. That's the challenge we have to face to get trust in the communities because the workers there actually are the people who keep their families with a, in, uh, in, in income with the capacity to survive. And they're our ESCOM employees. It really painted a picture of the immense nature of the struggle. Our trade unions, other leaders in communities can do this in every nation. But I think it's important today that we listen to both the commitment but also the, uh, the challenges that come with it. And I won't pretend to any of you, particularly our guests, that this is not the biggest systemic change that we have faced. We've seen many transitions in industry, in uh, um, geographical location of production, very many areas of our, our world of work that are transit in, have been in transition and not many of them just. So this time, if we don't get it right, if we leave people behind, we'll not just fail workers in their communities, we will fail to make the high ambition that we have to achieve in every industry. And we know well that energy is at the foundation 
of every industry and we have to transition every industry. And of course it does affect jobs and communities. So for us, just transition, unions at the table being part of the design with governments, with employers, both at the national and the local level, and of course internationally is critical. COP was, uh, COP failed on a whole range of very important fronts, one of which was the trust with communities on the outside. But we know that inside we made progress on some of these issues and now we have to drive them home. And energy is at the core of that. Fadi started by recognising the impact of the war on Ukraine. Um, I actually think we were already in a, gap, in a series of wars around gas. I shouldn't perhaps use the, the word war, but it really was a struggle around gas and uh, versus clean energy. We've now just seen that, uh, I think, grow to being a, a competition on steroids. But we have to get this transition right. If we're gonna have energy security, if we're going to have clean energy and if we're going to have good, decent jobs. So I'm going to leave it there, but say that uh, as I hand over to Sam, both the opportunity to talk to the IEA and our, uh, our friends about the struggles in various uh, countries through case studies and general discussion is, is important, I think for us so we all understand. But equally, uh, Fatty and Brian, the chance to engage with employers who indeed are on the same page. Or if they're not, let's see if we can get on the same page with dialogue and with governments through your authority or under the banner of your authority is, I think, a very, very good opportunity. So thank you very much. And Sam, I would ask you to introduce our case studies for us. Thank you so much, Sharon, and uh, um, thanks everybody for a really rich discussion so far. So as Sharon said, in the Just Transition Center, our job is to help unions, our members, people who should be our members, um, uh, informal workers associations, get good plans for just transition. We're working with unions around the world on, on this. And, uh, it's great to be able in this meeting to present two very different case studies with experiences from the front lines of just transition. Um, I should add as well, since we were also going to just briefly discuss the, the role of this labor council, as our co-chairs have said, we sort of see our, our role as labor in providing inputs and advice from the labor movement on the IAA's work, building on collaboration with and work by the ILO, but also facilitating collaboration and analysis to support trade unions and energy ministers in delivering just transition tailored to their own circumstances. And that's what you're going to hear right now. So first you'll hear from, uh, from, from Lebehang, who's already introduced herself. You'll hear about the status of just transition in South Africa including the, uh, the jobs that are at stake, the prospects for creation of good new jobs, and also uh, probably the view of labor on things such as the Just Transition Energy Partnership. And um, in that context, just to say that in South Africa, as, as we all know, you have historically high unemployment at the moment, 44%, I think, in the last analysis from the South African government. Um, very high youth unemployment. And in addition to the jobs at ESCOM that you mentioned, Sharon, you have a lot of people who um, are employed either directly or indirectly in the value chain of coal. So that includes not only coal miners, but also people transporting coal. Um, there's also, of course, an, an issue not only of energy security and energy access, but really of spiraling energy prices, which are, uh, which are getting higher because of, of the current crisis that you referred to, Fatih, in your, in your opening remarks. So that's one case study. Um, Lebohang uh, is a member of the Presidential Coordinating Commission on Climate Change. 
She sits in the National Social um, Social Dialogue Body uh, for South Africa. Um, she's been deeply involved in uh, trying to uh, help build a just transition in our movement in South Africa, along with all of her comrades in Kasatu uh, or other affiliates and Kasatu's affiliates. So it's been a great pleasure to work with you, Leva Hong, over the last few years on this. And then um, I'll just introduce Frederick while I'm at it. Uh, Frederick um, is from DGB, the largest German trade union confederation. And uh, Germany recently got a new government, which is uh, agreed that it's going to speed up its delivery of its, its climate targets, including the energy transition. Um, some parts of that are great in the sense that they will create lots of jobs. Um, it's our job to make sure that those new jobs are good jobs, but it's also going to present some challenges because it's, there are a lot of uh, good jobs at stake. Um, and now, of course, in addition, to, uh, in addition to the plans of the new government, there are new plans at the EU level and from the German government to move even faster on this transition as they try to become independent on uh, imported Russian gas. So I think Frederick is really going to give us an update from the from the front line of very, very rapid energy transition in an industrialized country. So please, Lebohang, if you want to if you want to start off, then we can hear from Frederick and then it'd be great to have a bit of a discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Sam, and, and, and thanks for, for the introduction. I think uh, you know, the work that we've been able to, to do here in South Africa is because of the support of the Just Transition Center as well as the ITUC. Um, this subject matter is actually very difficult. I think the more and more we, we delve into the dynamics of a just transition, then do we actually see that we've actually signed up for Mission Impossible here. Um, but it's been interesting to, to, to watch the, the discussion pan out. So we've been doing this we're going for the six years. We, 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 we've been at this for, for, for six years. And I, and I must say, I've seen a shift, not only in the trade union movement, but I'm already starting to see a shift in some of the social dialogue um, that we're having, either with business, either with um, uh, governments and, 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 and in civil society organization. There definitely has been a shift. And that can be attributed to the, to the mass lobby work that the trade union movement um, does. I think we spend 80% of our time lobbying. Um, so it's starting to bear fruit. I mean, I sat in one of the presidential climate change commission meetings and I just looked at everybody talking about just transition with, uh, with such excitement. And I just thought about, you know, six years ago, this was not the conversation. Um, so so that's, that's, that's really attributed to the work that, you know, the trade union movement has done. I think just to save time, I'm gonna, Quickly, just I have a couple of slides. I, I won't do I, I won't do too much um, today, and I'll also try to limit um, um, my my inputs. So I'm just going to give a bit of a background as to the case study of South Africa. What have we been up to, and 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 how is it playing out here in South Africa in terms of um, the just transition? And we know uh, the biggest hurdle is getting over the the energy transition first. So that's I think where we are. Um, as a nation. Maybe just to point out some of the, 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 the quick facts, um, as, and maybe this will tell you why our job is, 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 is currently as difficult as what it is. 85% um, of our electricity generation is dependent on coal. Um, before this meeting started, myself and the GS were panicking about the fact that uh, we might not have electricity because electricity um, uh, electricity security um, is, is also a challenge here in South Africa. Um, so we've got 85% of electricity being generated from coal. Um, and, and we must say coal is, is, is also one of South Africa's largest export um, by, by value. Um, it, it accounts for about 61 billion rand. If we have to, to, to convert that to dollars, that would be around 4.6 billion. Um, coal mining sector, um, it employs about 82,000 um, workers. There is a 60% union density in the sector um, and, and a, large, a, a large share of that are our members. Um, ESCOM employs nearly 50,000 um, of, 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 of employees in, in its fleet um, 
um, coal or the coal-fired power stations. Um, and this is not just 50,000 rand is just what ESCOM is employing there. Um, a large number of other industries that are also linked indirectly to that particular sector, not to mention the informal sector um, that is also surrounding um, ESCOM and its various um, uh, power plants. Um, when it comes to you know the unemployment rate, Sam, you've already indicated this um, to a certain extent. We've got an unemployment crisis in South Africa uh, currently. This is why there's so much jitters uh, when we talk to workers about the possibility of a transition to a low carbon economy. Um, when you look at these quick facts that I've just quickly drawn up, you could just see from a bird's eye view that we're basically locked um, into coal. Our, our, our energy mineral, our mineral energy complex is basically in a coal lock-in. Therefore, our industrial policy is locked into coal. Um, and therefore, our integrated resource plan equally is locked into coal. So every time we talk about you know, the, the potential of an energy transition to a low carbon economy, these are um, the, the, the background that, that continues to plague, you know, especially the, 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 South African, the South African economy. Given the high uh, unemployment rate, and if you, if you take into consideration discouraged work seekers, it works up to 46.6%. Uh, youth unemployment is, 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 is even way higher than this um, at about 60, that is at about 60%. So when we talk about, you know, uh, phasing out jobs that are, people are currently dependent on and complete regions are dependent on these particular jobs, um, you can understand why there is a bit of anxiety when it comes to the issue of transition. And I think we've been dealing with that um, with, with, with our, our membership. I just wanted to give also a glance as to, you know, when it comes to, um, electricity production from the different sources. So the dominant player in South Africa, given the 82% that I've just indicated in the previous slide, is from oil, gas, um, and, and, and coal sources. So we went from a situation in the 1970s when there was an almost 100% dependence on oil, gas, and coal um, sources. Um, now it's at about 85 or so percent. Um, but at least what we're starting to see is that there is an uptake in renewable sources of energy. It's been slow, um, but, but, but it's starting to pick up. And I think as um, industrial policy is beginning to grapple with the shifts and the transitions that are taking place at an industry level, um, we'll see a greater increase in renewable sources of energy and a bit of a, a or a drastic at least decline in the oil, gas and coal sources of energy. If the discussions in government are anything to go about, um, the updated um, integrated resource plan, um, which we are starting to hear will be updated very soon, we'll start to talk about a commitment in line with our NDCs where we will see a gradual, we will see a, a, a significant decline in oil, gas and coal resources, um, coal sources um, in favor of an increase in, in renewable um, energy sources. Well, given the fact that we've got such a dependence on coal, um, and there's a nice slide that I should have put up here, which shows just how regions, particularly in Bumalanga, are so dependent on coal mining as well as coal fire power um, gener uh, energy generation activity. Um, you would see why um, you know workers are very hesitant for there to be a transition to a low carbon economy, and I think that's why Kosatu, as 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 early as the year two thousand and nine, has already started a process in order to assist workers. Um, in able to in able to adapt to the the, the changes in, in 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 our society in terms of transitions, but also to assist them with the requisite demands that workers need to start tabling at bargaining councils in order to bring about um, a just transition. I think one of the things that we've raised in our work um, and and what we're starting to communicate even when we do our our lobbying with our own uh, membership is around this idea that you know a transition is already underway. And our responsibility as a trade union federation is to equip workers with the necessary abilities, the necessary know-hows, and to engage in social dialogue in order to ensure that um, governments, businesses are in a position to 
assist workers in order to be able to adapt to the needs of a low carbon um, society. So all the things that we've always been advocating for around um, com comprehensive social security nets, um, uh, also the issues that we've also always talked about reskilling and upskilling, those become um, very important, but also to communicate to our workers that there are job creating uh, potential in the just transition to a low carbon economy. And I think that's the point that we continuously make um, here in South Africa. And that's why we participate in the various um, uh, platforms that we currently participate in, because we do believe in the job creating uh, potential of the new sectors that will emerge, um, especially when we transition to a low carbon economy. So in South Africa, I think we've we've made we've made incredible strides. I must I must say um, I pointed to the fact that um, six years ago when we were talking about issues pertaining to climate change, nobody was talking about the just transition. And now for it to be the catchphrase of the century, and um, at every meeting you go talks about the amazing strides that we've made um, as a trade union uh, movement. And I think even with the South African government, they've, 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 they've really come to the party in a really big way, um, wanting to create um, coordination amongst the various government departments to ensure that um, when we speak of a just transition, because the, the, the term is loaded, even though um, it, it, it is our term, you know, we're the ones that coined it. I mean, you knew the, the, the reason behind this, we didn't want workers to be left behind as a transition was unfolding. Um, but as and when other sectors of society and other stakeholders now start to grapple with the term, they assign various other meanings to it. So I must commend the South African government in the sense that they want to create a framework and they want to create a similar understanding of across various government departments as well as, well as across various um, stakeholders to ensure that we have a common understanding as to what we mean about the just transition. And I think I must attribute um, labor's, uh, labor's hard work in ensuring that you know, the needs of workers and communities are embedded in the meaning of a just transition. And, I, and, and the Presidential Climate Change Coordinating Commission that was established by the president in line with labor's um, demands in the job summit that there needs to be um, this commission, um, the, 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 the definitions around not leaving workers behind, reskilling and upskilling and comprehensive social security and the need for research and development are all embedded um, in, 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 in the definition of a just transition here in South Africa. So there's been an establishment of the very long term, um, but we always call it the, uh, the P4C. Um, the Presidential Climate Change Coordinating Commission has been established by um, the president. Um, and what it sets to do is to bring together a number of stakeholders, labor is included, um, a number of stakeholders who come together on a, on a regular basis to plan for the just transition um, for South Africa. Uh, one of the outcomes of the, of the commission, and this is year two of its, its establishment, has been the just transition framework. And in the just transition framework, we've already identified that, you know, the just transition must have characteristics of distributive justice. What we mean by that is that justice must, so in the, in the, in the just transition planning process, there should not be a situation where the, 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 there's a situation where there's winners as well as losers. Um, so this is what we mean by distributive justice. So justice in, in, in this sense means that we must all bear the cost of the transition as a society, and we must move together in order to achieve it, uh, justice within the just transition, which is important, especially for South Africa, given our historical context. Procedural justice refers to, you know, the need for there to be certain procedures that will ensure that workers and communities are indeed included and factored into the just transition. And then this idea of restorative justice, which for South Africa, given its historical context, is very important. There are a number of um, groupings in, in, in South African society that have not been factored into economic participation or justice after um, democracy. So it's very important that those groupings now become factored in um, as we seek to achieve restorative justice. Uh, Sharon has already started talking about this and, and Sam, you already talked about this and, and was one of the outcomes um, for COP26. I don't know, COP26 for South Africa was good. <laughs> Um, but, you know, the outcome of, 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 of the political declaration um, 
for, for the just transition and just transition financing for South Africa, I think has been a major breakthrough. Um, the members on this council have already talked about the fact that transitions cost money. Uh, you know, when, when, when we look at the, the various social and labor plans that we're tabling with the Presidential Climate Change Coordinating Commission, I sometimes look at these and I'm thinking, this is going to cost a lot of money. And the question is going to be who pays for this? Um, so, so, so the just transition financing through this political declaration is a breakthrough for South Africa, not just for South Africa, but other developing countries and other emerging con economies that seek to endeavor um, to engage in a process of transition. Um, so for us, the political declaration, I think, is a game changer, and it takes us on the path of transition, and it assists us to achieve the social imperatives of a tra transition. We often say that because of market, market mechanisms, the transition aspect is going to be taken care of. I think, you know, businesses are going to follow where the money is. So the market mechanisms are gonna take care of the transition part sooner or later. The justice element of it is social in nature. And that requires government, that requires trade union, that requires civil society. Now these people that I've just mentioned, the government, social, uh, labor and civil society, these people don't have money. So it, it is up to, you know, declarations of this nature to finance the work uh, on the social work and the justice element of the transition so that when the two come together, the social, uh, the justice and the, and, the, and the transition elements of it, when they come together, they move together and they move together without one overstepping the other, which for, for our society is actually quite important because it allows us to achieve not just a transition, but also our developmental imperatives. Um, I think one of the, the, the important things about, about you know, the South African process is also how we've gone about um, our NDC deliberations for South Africa. I think for the first time ever, we're not only talking about NDCs, which can be a very scientific and technical conversation all on its own, but what we've attached to it is around the notion of a just transition. So just transition is very much embedded in South Africa's NDC. Um, and this is because, you know, we said, yes, increase the ambition, but just make sure that the just transition also accompanies our NDC so that the two um, move together harmoniously, because for our society, I think this is actually quite important. Um, we've, 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 as South Africa, we've recently had deliberations on a climate change bill. And what we seek to do with this climate change bill is to disaggregate the discussion around the, 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 the just transition. So for Currently, it's very much at a, at a national level at the Presidential Climate Change Coordinating Commission. But through the bill, what we have is this process of factoring down you know, the just transition at the various spheres of government so that at local level, at regional level, you have just transition committees that will take into consideration the outcomes of the Climate Change Coordination Commission and implement it in their various spheres um, of government. Lastly, I'm going to talk about um, ESCOM, um, which is the power utility um, for South Africa. It's currently going through a number and of- We might just have to be brief, Lebo, because we've now got another one to go. Yes, very brief. Um, so just to talk just briefly about, you know, the, 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 the ESCOM. So ESCOM, all of its en energy generation, electricity generation is all coal based. Um, but because of some of the groundbreaking work of the trade unions here in South Africa, they'll be repurposing, uh, repurposing their power stations um, for, 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 for renewable energy um, production, which is a game changer because um, a, a little while ago, uh, two to three years ago, when you talked about renewable energy generation, it was only to be done by independent power producers. So now that ESCOM is entering into the game, we're going to now start to see renewable energy generation that is going to be done by the state um, as well. This is important because ESCOM can start to can start to model what we mean by just transition. We've been pitching the idea of a jobs guarantee to ESCOM. And what this means is that um, all the workers that ESCOM currently have, they will not lay them off as they transition to a low carbon economy. So we're piloting, we're seeking to, 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 to pilot this with with ESCOM, and if this is successful, hopefully it can be the case for all other industries and all other um, utilities that seek to also engage in the process of, 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 of a transition or a just transition at that. I think I'll leave it at that as the South African um, case study. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Lebo. And uh, before Sam introduces uh, um, Frederick, can I just say to everybody that you know, the ESCOM model 
there was a two-year study, indeed, of the impact of the transition on communities and workers. So steeped in research, steeped in the voices of workers and communities, and a very strong bargaining unit of the unions in the company itself makes it much easier to actually frame the plan and build support. So I thank Becky and you very much for this incredible work, Lebo, and we're all here as you'll meet the ups and downs along the way. But Sam, back to you. We only have uh, a limited time, so we want to hear Frederick. Yeah, I'll be super brief. So uh, just to say that um, it's been a great uh, pleasure, but also we have learned a ton from uh, accompanying Frederick and DGB and the German trade union movement as they uh, tried to set a standard for just transition in in coal phase out, certainly in develop in developed countries, but maybe also some things that uh, that we can learn from in other parts of the world. So, Frederick, the challenges are even bigger now. It would be great to hear from you about where we are at. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Um, I try to make it very brief and focusing on that coal issue, and maybe we have time to discuss the other points later. So um, just as a first remark, uh, why is it so important that unions are working on that issues of energy transition and climate change? And I think that is why the climate change has lots of impacts on the world of labor. Uh, to be honest, it is necessary to say this because the workers are affected at the workplace, um, especially in qualification issues um, when it comes to new technologies um, by extreme weather um, uh, heat and so on. As consumers, they are affected. At the moment, we see this by this increase of the energy prices, and um, workers are con and workers are affected in the structural change. And um, I'd like to give you some ideas on how we organized and negotiated that coal phase out in Germany. Um, yeah, which is about structural change in the coal sector. So in Germany, the transformation of the economy has achieved the first steps, but the big steps are yet to come. And um, um, the agreement on the coal phase out is one of these first steps. Um, I don't know if you know the structure of um, the electricity supply in Germany. So let me say that um, around 30% of our um, electricity comes from coal. Around 50% is yet to come from renewables. So we have a very um, good increase in the last 20 years, but for sure it is not enough because Germany also wants to replace nuclear and uh, not only coal. So um, in the coal sector, we do have uh, around 25,000 um, workers, which are working directly in the coal sector, mining and uh, power stations, and around 80,000 workers indirectly. And um, yeah, Regarding this um, energy supply by uh, the coal sector, it is necessary to underline that 100,000 of jobs are related to the coal sector in the energy intensive industries, uh, which uh, got the supply from uh, the coal at the moment. So when we talk about the coal phase out, it is also a debate on the transformation of our energy intensive industry, or especially the energy intensive industry. So in Germany, the plan is uh, phasing out by 2038. This uh, was an outcome of our coal commission um, in which the unions were part of, and also other stakeholders of our society, of the economy were part of. And um, there is this um, fixed coal phase-out plan, uh, we have this um, a coal phase-out act, uh, which was passed by our parliament uh, one and a half year ago. And um, from the union's point of view, it was necessary that this coal phase-out was designed by clear uh, checkpoints. So um, we demand um, 
the acceleration of our energy transition, we had um, the demand that there will be a structural aid for the coal regions, that we have social security for the workers, and um, also the participation of the social partners in the whole process of the phasing out of coal. And um, this was set by the government. Um, there was a structural enhancement act. And um, out of this act, um, there is a, an amount of 40 billion euros spent for the coal regions. And to give you an idea of the relation, the gross added value of the lignite um, mining industry in Germany is 4 billion euro. So for a time period of 20 years, um, this structural aid is half of the gross added value. I think it is useful to know that to have a relation to what uh, this phase out means economically for um, the German economy. And now we have a new Climate Protection Act, uh, which has a much more um, challenging um, climate goals. And also we have a new government which is facing um, um, an acceleration of the coal phase out by 2030. Um, from, from the union's point of view, um, the workers' participation was a key for a just transition in the coal sector. So um, as I said before, there is a very high level of, um, of social security, no business related layoffs in mining and power plants. We have some kind of compensation of lost wages, um, uh, which is made by uh, collective agreements. We have qualification programs and some kind of adjustment allowance as a bridge to an early retirement for the coal miners. This is fine. And from our point of view, it is necessary that this high level of social security um, is also secure when it comes to an acceleration of the coal phase out. But the question is, what comes after the coal? So the task is to develop the coal regions and uh, to spend this amount of 40 billion euro into a new economical perspective for the coal regions. And um, as unions, um, we um, want to shape, to be um, an, an active um, um, yeah, stakeholder in that uh, debate, not only on the company level, even uh, on the regional level to influence uh, the debates on the regional level to have good investments, new investments into new technologies. And that is why the DGB initiated a project, um, a project to support all the union's initiatives and programs um, on the regional level. So, um, there was an opening of regional offices in all co-regions in Germany by the DGB, strengthening all these uh, union activities in the transition of the co-regions and also uh, being a contact point for workers, for works councils, and uh, even for the unions on the regional level. And um, yeah, we started this in the last autumn and now it will work for first phase um, for around four years. and. Uh, I think it is a small thing for this whole debate, but it's a big thing for the union to um, be visible in this structural change of the co-regions. And it is a very, um, yeah, very important activity um, for us to, um, yeah, have a, have a just transition. Yeah, but what's next? The question is, um, at the moment, um, the war on the Ukraine and the impacts of this uh, crucial war on the energy supply in Germany, on the coal phase out. So there are lots of discussions. Uh, we have a very intensive um, contact with our government at the moment on all these aspects. And um, um, I think um, from now, on it is not clear which measures um, for an acceleration of the energy uh, transition um, are useful and are working in a very short time period this is a debate we have uh, in germany at the moment and also inside the unions 
but I think it is necessary to talk on these things. And um, I think what is clear is that uh, we need a massive expansion of the renewables. This is what the DGB uh, um, has demanded for lots of years, even for decades. And uh, now it is time for action. And uh, we are in good context with our Ministry of Economical Affairs on these um, issues. Even in these days, there is a, a, um, a debate with the Ministry on a new um, act um, on um, the expansion of the renewables. Uh, so we are discussing with which concrete measures um, um, we can um, yeah, increase um, the renewables, but it's also about energy efficiency and it's about uh, the diversification of our fossil fuel demand. Um, so lots of uh, questions which are on the table. But as a result, what are our learnings of um, our activities um, in this area of energy transition? I'd like to give you, um, yeah, as my, my last comment, so to speak, for this uh, input, six points, uh, which I think are very important. So the first point is, um, it is necessary when it comes to a structural change that you involve all these relevant actors in this transition process, like this coal commission in Germany or this task force in Canada or in other parts of the world. From our point, it is necessary to have a high level of co-determination because the employees, uh, employees are the drivers of the sustainable development with their hands and with their heads. So it is necessary that they are on the table. It's about further training. So when it comes to new technologies, it is necessary that the workers are trained that they know what they are doing. Um, the first point, fourth point from our point of view is, um, yeah, collective bargaining agreements are very useful. We've seen this in the coal phase out process in Germany as well. It is a very um, high level of security, even because of this collective agreements our unions made with the employers. Fifth point is you need a social security in times of change. Um, this is also a learning from our German coal phase out. Um, and um, the last point is you need a clear political framework for workers, for investments, and even for new economical perspectives. This costs money. And it's the task uh, to organize the money that it is working for new jobs and new economical perspectives and for a just transition. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Frederick. And indeed, uh, thanks to everybody. I know we're out of time, but I wondered, Ryan, if, uh, if you can... Um, indeed uh, um, maybe make a few points in wrapping up. We can share these presentations with you and Frederick's six points, et cetera, as well. But uh, it would be really helpful, I think, Brian, if you were, or Fatty or one of the team was to some, just to make a few concluding remarks and then maybe Becky. But we do need now to say, well, if we're gonna look at this work carefully, how do we then present it as part and parcel of a dialogue that we want to take to either key industry leaders or to governments? And uh, we, you and I will talk about that with um, Becky and Lebo and Sam before the next meeting. But over to you, Brian, and thank you to everybody. Thank you very much, Sharon. And let me add my thanks to everybody. It's really instructive and, and informative for us to be here today. And, and all of us have really learned a lot from, from all of you and, and we're delighted to have this opportunity. And the first of many opportunities, I hope. I hope that this can be just our first meeting and we're going to continue to get to know each other better in this group and also individually. But certainly for us, from our perspective of looking at, at net zero transitions, decarbonization, clean energy transitions, whatever you want to call them, 
that they very much need to be people-centered processes. A, because that's what they're for. They're for making people's lives better. They're for making all of our lives better. But secondly, of course, they'll fail without putting people first. And we've already seen as many bad examples as good examples uh, in this regard. And therefore, to hear from the two case studies in particular, Germany and South Africa, different in very many ways, very different contextually, very different dif different um, underlying features, and yet common challenges, common journeys underway. It's really fascinating to hear the excellent work that's been going on in both cases and some commonalities in terms of what the hints are of what success looks like in terms of, of really strong engagement, good social dialogue, inclusion of all partners, and of course, the injections of both time and money. And both of those present their own challenges, both in terms of the affordability of transitions and the kind of measures that maybe uh, some countries have used. And uh, even more so in many ways time because we're we're under pressure to drive change our governments have set very ambitious targets for for pathways towards net zero and as you said earlier sharon we really need to not underestimate the extent of change and the pace of change that is coming so one thing that's been really i must say gratifying for us here today is to hear the extent of commitment and readiness to engage from from all of you i think it's really great to hear the, the amount of dialogue that's going on, the amount of th new thinking, ideas, generation, and exchange. In terms of going forward, I really want to say that 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 our governments, the, the energy ministries and the climate ministries and the governments around the world that we work for and we work with are keen to do this right and really want to learn from you. They want to learn from us. They want to learn from each other. So there's a real understanding of the need to put these issues more to the fore than perhaps they have been in, in the past and, and a need to understand from each other what works, what doesn't work, uh, and to really strengthen the people-centered dimensions of all of these many policies, investment programs, action plans that are being put in place around the world. So we're very keen to continue to learn from all of you so it, it can inform our work here at the Secretariat inform our dialogue with business, inform our dialogue directly with ministers and ministries. And we're looking forward to learning an awful lot more from you in the future of this council. So Sharon and Becky, thanks to both of you for your co-chairing and for your leadership. And thanks to all the members for joining us today. Becky. No, thank you very much. And thank you very much for all. I think it has been a very fruitful experience learning. And of course, we agree that uh, Sam will have to coordinate the introduction of the work that is being happening in different countries, share and create a platform for all the members of the council to be able to work. And I think it will also allow some bilaterals that we can compare the studies of other countries and as a uh, Dr. Brawler indicated to avoid the pitfalls that other countries have gone through for those who are late coming. We were to <clears throat> discuss maybe the frequency, but I think we are running out of time. I think Sharon and the other team will have to discuss this off the, the, the record to indicate when will be the next meeting, depending on the work that needed to be done, but also for the future item. And I think in our engagement with the different ministries, will have to bite this big elephant in small pieces so that at least we are doing what we, we call it a building block so that we can see the movement because you can't address all these issues, all of them at the same time. I think we need to choose and identify what are regarded to be the building blocks. We appreciate your time. We, we think this was the right decision to take and uh, welcoming by the IEE in terms of working together. We appreciate your time. We know that in other countries it's very late. In other countries it might be too early, but we, we are grateful. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.